Hey everyone, geophysicist Stefan Burns here. There is a lot that's happening energetically in the Arctic, as many of you are well aware of. And the most recent addition to this is that magnitude 8.8 .8 mega quake that struck off the coast of Kamchatka there on July 29, 2025. We see these seismic waves propagate out across the entire globe. We see them picked up by North American Seismic Network, the Eurasian Seismic Network. In fact, they go out in all directions, but that means that a significant amount of energy actually traveled here through the Arctic Circle, and that is where we have a lot happening right now. We have the magnetic pole in the Northern Hemisphere moving from its position originally over Canada to now Siberia, the flux lobes have been changing. The Canadian flux lobe has been weakening. The Siberian magnetic flux lobe has been strengthening, pulling that magnetic field. There's also Gockel Ridge, which is the slowest spreading center in the world. And at the very tail end of that is Gockel Supervolcano, one of, if not the biggest supervolcanoes in the world. And so this massive release of energy through that area is potentially causing some energetic perturbations to these other systems. We're gonna dive into that today. And let's start off with the epicenter of this magnitude 8.8 .8 mega quake that struck on July 29th. We see that right here. This is at a depth of 35 kilometers. You'll notice right nearby, super close by, just if we measure this just about 42 kilometers away, we had a magnitude nine mega quake that was on November 4th of 1952. Both of them very similar to each other. Both of them created significant tsunamis that traveled across the Pacific Ocean. Their intensity varied a little bit, but in general, they weren't the biggest tsunami, though the effects were quite powerful here uh, on the Kanchaka Peninsula and for some of these nearby towns. So. We have this regular release of very high magnitude energy clearly from Kanchaka because we have this magnitude 8.8 .8 in 2025 and we have this magnitude 9 going back about 70 years. And so there may be a recurrence interval of about 70, 50, 100 years, somewhere in that range for these sort of powerful earthquakes. And that makes sense just based off the fact that this is a very big, deep extended subduction zone. And that's where you get the biggest earthquakes, these sort of mega thrust events where you get a massive displacement of the underlying geology, one plate sliding on top of the other. Now, if we go further into the Arctic, because that is outside the Arctic Circle, if we turn on our lines, we see that the Arctic Circle is right here above. So now we're in the Arctic Circle. And we know that these waves propagated out like this. Now, what's really interesting is that actually just about 24 hours, maybe a little bit more after that magnitude 8.8 .8 is that we had this magnitude five earthquake here in Canada. So this was at a depth of 10 kilometers. And this is not a seismically active area for the most part. It does not mean that you can't get magnitude twos, threes, fours, and occasionally fives, but the, timing of that is very circumspect. It makes you think that maybe it was triggered by that magnitude 8.8 .8 because what happens is you get this energy here radiating out and then if you have a fault that's at a critical stress, that energy passing over it can cause it to finally rupture. And so what this demonstrates is that this energy from the magnitude 8.8 .8 was able to disturb the environment of this area here. Well, look at this right there. That is the movement of the magnetic pole in the Northern Hemisphere. This is a south magnetic pole technically, or in other words, a negative polarity magnetic pole, meaning that you have particle flux coming in from outer space, depositing down into that flux tube and then depositing down into the ionosphere with aurora and these flows of plasma in the atmosphere and more. So we see the movement of the magnetic pole in the Northern Hemisphere going from Canada, going towards Siberia at this moment in time. And so we see these two flux lobes. Here's the Siberian flux lobe. You can see it's quite a bit larger than the Canadian flux lobe, but there is this bifurcation in the Arctic. And so the prevailing idea that makes the most sense is that because this Canadian flux lobe has weakened over the past five decades or so, it goes back further than that. But because of that, 
that has pulled the magnetic field, this magnetic pull in the northern hemisphere, towards the Siberian flux flow while at the same time that has been strengthening. Now what you'll notice is that right now in 2025, this is the location of the magnetic pole in the northern hemisphere. And it was traveling very quick at the turn of the millennium and it's been reducing in speed. So here's the location for 2001 and in between 2001 and 2007, it was moving at approximately 55 kilometers per year. And then from 2007 to 2010, it even went up to about 60 kilometers per year. Then it started to decrease. Now the most recent measurements going from 2020 to 2025 indicate that it was moving about 42 kilometers per year. So there has been a deceleration of the magnetic pole in the northern hemisphere, which makes sense considering it's getting closer and closer to the Siberian flux lobe. But you'll notice this green line there. What is that? That is a mid-ocean ridge. This in fact is Gockel Ridge, the northernmost part of the mid-Atlantic ocean ridge system where you have new oceanic plate being created. So this is the slowest mid-ocean ridge and slowest spreading on the planet at about six to 10 millimeters per year. So very, very slow. And it's slowest right here in this massive caldera that we see, which is Gockel supervolcano, at least the last remnant of a major explosion there about 1.1 million years ago, based off of a variety of different lines of evidence. Now I turn on a few features here to highlight this supervolcano that is lurking in the Arctic. The last big eruption that we know of was 1.1 million years ago and about 3,000 cubic kilometers of material was ejected from this. The oceanic crust is very thin here. You even have in some places the mantle exposed at the surface. That's what the geologic reconnaissance is suggesting. And this makes this a VEIA eruption, one of the largest ever recorded, comparable to Toba and a couple other locations on the planet. So a massive magma reservoir exists here and it has very unique properties because the CO2 percentage and the volatile gas percentage is an order of magnitude higher than it is in most other regions. So there is this natural differentiation process that's unfolding here along Gockel Ridge that leads to very explosive magma. There's this confining pressure on top of it, but when that can finally get broken because there's so many volatiles sequestered within that magma when they depressurize it's extremely explosive and so back in 1999 there was a seismic swarm that occurred here and they recorded a bunch of magnitude fives and they were wondering what the heck was happening because we only had the global seismic network at that time we did not have a high resolution data for what was happening just some of these pings on the larger network which picks up a minimum at 4.5 magnitude or so so they went down with submersibles and checked out what happened afterwards and they actually found the creation of three new volcanoes odin loki and thor and they also found pyroclastic glass deposits along the base of these new volcanoes, indicating that these eruptions were powerful enough to create pyroclastic flows under kilometers of ocean water, which means that there's tremendous pressure there, making it difficult to have pyroclastic flows. Yet the geology of this area is so unique that it was able to do that. And these were small volcanoes that were created. They were definitely not uh, you know, calderas like this. This is an ancient remnant suggesting what the Earth is capable of. So we have this setting of the magnetic pole moving towards Gockel Ridge, where you already have this natural convective flow of energy. And because Gockel Ridge is very, very slow as a spreading center, yet other spreading centers on Earth, like here, for example, in the Atlantic, are at higher rates, like this is like you know, 1.5 centimeters to three centimeters per year. Right here, it's only uh, one centimeter or even six millimeters per year. This indicates that this spreading, it's, it's not completely alleviating all the energy that exists in that region. And perhaps sometimes you get this super volcano eruption to release it. Now, the other interesting thing is that this is a spreading center, right? We have this spreading center going all the way up. The Earth is expanding here in the Arctic. But then here, it kind of 
slows down. Now, this green line indicates that this is still a spreading center, and then here this white line indicates that's just a different sort of plate boundary. So this is a plate boundary that moves through here. And then eventually we get out here on the other side of Kamchatka. This other plate boundary takes us straight to Japan where eventually we reach the subduction zone. So we have this kind of unique situation where the North American plate is butting up against the Eurasian plate. Here they are spreading apart from each other, but in this zone they are not. And honestly to me, Let's see if I can turn this around in a certain way. Honestly, to me, it looks like the purpose of the supervolcano here is to eventually connect these two locations together. Because we get this spreading center going all the way from Iceland like this, and then is it a coincidence that we have this supervolcano right at the end of it? And then now at the bottom of that, of that caldera, we are seeing that mid-ocean ridge very slowly spreading. Perhaps the next super volcano magma reservoir is over here and eventually that will erupt and then that will lengthen this Gockel Ridge spreading center. It's an idea. Maybe eventually this entire zone will be blasted off and we will get spreading and rifting through that zone. This is like a geologic time scale of millions of years. This could be like 30, 50, 100 million years uh, of context here. Perhaps that's what's happening because we do see in general, this rifting between North America and Eurasia and also Africa down here. And so that does continue up into the Arctic, but eventually kind of peters out. So what's so interesting about this is that we have the magnetic pole in the Northern Hemisphere getting closer and closer to this mid-ocean ridge. So it's already this convective flow of energy, and now you also have more flux from the sun and space weather overall, just the outside environment of the Earth funneling down to this area because of that magnetic pole. And if you look here, for example, we had this magnitude five earthquake there. The magnetic pole spent a lot of time right here in this Canadian flux slope. So you can imagine that over the course of a few hundred years, that particle flux is going to generate some enhanced energy reservoir or movement or flow of energy underneath this area deeper like in the athenosphere and also in the mantle because while a lot of these particles are hitting the ionosphere and creating aurora and the flow of plasma in the ionosphere which is the northern lights for example those induce electric currents down below so you also get particle flux down below and some of these particles they're not going to interact with the atmosphere they're going to keep traveling down and eventually interact further down in the crust the athenosphere the mantle even down perhaps to the core, they really follow those magnetic field lines. And ultra low frequency, this is like sub five hertz pulsations, will also travel through the, the crust no problem and cause energy flux deeper. So you have that environment. So we've had this traveling enhanced energy flux going from Canada now over Siberia, indicating that there's been some geologic mixing, you could say, like energy mixing in this area. And then this magnitude five earthquake here that occurred right after 8.8 .8 is just a little bit of an indication that that energy from the 8.8 .8 hit that area that was already under a little bit greater flux because of the location of this magnetic pole. And now it's moving to the zone that already has a lot of energy flux. And again, going back here, the recurrence interval for this seems to be fairly frequent. So this area on the geologic scale is constantly getting blasted with magnitude nine energy from these earthquakes. So it really makes you wonder if something is brewing underneath the surface in the Arctic Ocean, and now we have this convergence of all these factors, the magnetic pole moving towards Gockel Ridge, and in general, this supervolcano system. We know that there's been recent activity. New volcanoes have been created just in the past 30 years. We had a seismic storm also in February 2018. And we've been having a lot of earthquake activity overall, some very powerful space weather. And we've been in 300 years of increasing solar activity due to the modern maximum. So where does all this lead? That is an unknown, but I'm looking at Gockel Supervolcano very closely. Is it waking up? That's a good question. Hopefully not. But at the same time, 
if Earth did have to release a tremendous amount of energy for whatever reason, this is one of the best places for it to do it, I would think, because it's kind of isolated, right? You don't have too many people living here. You don't have too many people living there. It would be a massive climate shock, of course, uh, and there would be tsunamis that would go all across this area and, and ash clouds and more. I mean, it would be an apocalyptic event. But there are a few places on the Earth that, in the grand scheme, are better for there to be a release of such energy. So watching this area closely, especially with the context of the magnetic field and how that is shifting, I'll keep you up to date on all this. But this latest mega quake here definitely is causing me to look at the Gockel supervolcano system much more closely. And I'll keep you up to date with any new developments. So please subscribe to the channel if you have not done so already. Smash that like button, help the channel grow. Again, I've been your host, Stefan Burns. Thank you all so much for watching. Wishing all of you well. I'll see you all in the next video.